Well, good morning and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Happy Thanksgiving Day 2020. Thank you for joining me. Grab your Bible and a cup of coffee. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll get there in just a minute. In the meantime, uh, let me share some prayer requests with you that we can be lifting up together to, to the Lord. Would you pray today, especially for a young lady in a neonatal intensive care unit? Her name is Raylan Grace Dula. It's the granddaughter of dear friend Lester Evans from our Baptist family in North Carolina. Born prematurely, she's struggling for her life today. Would you pray God's grace upon little Raylan Grace that she might survive this day and look forward to a happy future with God's blessings in her life? And also continue to pray for Hayward Belt. You might have been here with us yesterday as we were praying for his surgery on his back which did not happen yesterday because he was not strong enough to go through it. So they are right now keeping him in the hospital so that he can regain his strength to the point that they can perhaps do this surgery. So pray for his strength and healing today. And then also we've been praying for educators all week long on Wake Up in the Word. I want to give you two more names to pray for as you pray for those that come to your mind. And these are some of the folks that aren't necessarily teachers, but they're the support staff that helps the teachers get things done. The two we want to pray for today are Flory Coates, who works in food service down there for Ben Lippin Academy on the campus of Columbia International University. What a great school and what a great place to be serving some of God's people. Also for Jeff Spires out of our church. It works right here at Richard Wynn Academy. Uh, doing all kinds of things. Jeff uh, just heading out first as a volunteer and as a parent, uh, three kids there, just wanting to help any way he can. And uh, Jeff, because of your health, I tell you what, we're just praying for you and what a, a challenge it is for you to get out there and make it happen. But thank you, brother, for doing that here at Richard Wynn and allowing God to use you on that campus. Then as we get to our Thanksgiving passage today, it really brings to light some of the uh, situations we face around the world today. What do you do? Do you become bitter and angry and mad at your circumstances and thereby just make yourself miserable? Or do you face them with the joy of the Lord? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we have some great instructions today for Thanksgiving Day. Let's not just read over them quickly. Let's heed them and take them to heart. Beginning in verse 16, a simple command. It says, be joyful always. Your version might say something like rejoice always. It's either two or three words, but you get the point. You need to have the joy of the Lord just spewing out of you at all times. This is possible regardless of what's going on because his Holy Spirit is in your heart. If you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and his Holy Spirit provides as a part of the fruit of being in your life and having control, provides you with joy that will get you through any difficult circumstance. Verse 17 says, pray continually. Two words in the NIV or in some versions it might say, like the King James, pray without ceasing. Three words. Okay, so again, two or three words, but you get the picture. Be in a state of prayer, a heart and a mind of prayer all day long. Don't let any circumstances overcome you that don't have God's perspective shined upon them. And that will allow you to not only communicate with God about what's going on, but it'll allow you to see what he's doing. Let you see the bigger picture and maybe have a perspective that others don't on your circumstances. And then speaking of circumstances, that's what we get in verse 18. When for Thanksgiving and every day, not just today, we're told, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is that you be thankful. The circumstances may be horrific. They may be terrible. But what you and I are supposed to do is give thanks in all circumstances. Then through that heart of gratitude, God is able to work. He's able to touch. He's able to open doors. He is able to allow Romans 8, 28 to come into play, which says we know all things work together for good to them that love God and are the, are the called according to his purpose. So when you begin to give thanks for those circumstances, instead of just backing up and being angry and bitter and complaining and, and bad mouthing and, you know, finding somebody to blame instead of that, 
then God's able to use you in the midst of those circumstances, perhaps to be the blessing for others that they need. You know, that's the kind of attitude that kept the pilgrims going during that first year, a year that was tragic, was terrible. The Mayflower had stayed there in the harbor waiting for the next spring to go back to England. And even those hardened sailors were able to see in the lives of the pilgrims some things that they needed to see to adjust their own lives. It was difficult on them. Some of the sailors were dying as well. And it says that when the worst was finally over, they had lost some 47 people. This is after the, the following March. Nearly half their original number. 13 out of 18 wives died. Only three families remained unbroken. Of all the first comers, the children fared the best. Of seven daughters, none died. Of 13 sons, only three. And the colony, which was young to begin with, was even younger now. But of course, compared with Jamestown's 80 to 90 percent mortality rate, they came through remarkably well. But through it all, their hearts remained soft towards God. As Peter Marshall relates, he said whether they knew that they were being tested, as Bradford later suspected, the high point of their week remained Sunday worship when the beat of a field drum would summon them to the morning and afternoon services all on board the Mayflower would come ashore. They would join the procession led by William Brewster, their spiritual leader, until a pastor could come over. And, of course, John Carver, the governor, and Miles Standish, who provided a bit of security. Yes, they did have a security team in this first church. As they made their way up the hill, the joyful shouts unto God and the praise kept them going. How could they be joyful in these circumstances? People were sick, people were dying, but yet they turned their hearts toward God in worship and it got them through every single day. But as they were looking at how God had protected them, they faced a very rough year. What were they going to do at this point? How were they going to proceed? And amazingly enough, they felt God's hand of providence again in a very unique way. When one day somebody shouted, there's an Indian coming, Indian coming. Somebody said, don't you mean Indians? No, no, it was just one. <laughs> a man who came strolling down the main street there, the main little dirt path into the village, and looked around and said, welcome in perfect English. The pilgrims were so startled they could hardly speak at length. They required with as much gravity as they could answer, well, welcome. Their visitor fixed them with a piercing stare and said, have you got any beer? <laughs> oh, come on now. The first thing after welcome is, have you got any beer? They said, well, you don't know no, the beer's all gone, but we've got some brandy. Would you like some of that? He said, oh yeah. So they set a meal before this particular Native American and began to celebrate with him and described how he spoke very good English and could communicate because he had been traveling with some other explorers and settlers. This particular man was named Samoset. Samoset was a Sagamore, a chief of the Algonquins. And he began to share with them something that they did not understand and had no knowledge of, yet it was a picture of how providentially they had landed in just the right spot. You see, they could have landed in many other places on the coast of the United States, what's now the United States, of this new world, this America, a place, places where they would have been slaughtered. Instead, they had landed here. The story is quite interesting. You see, this was the territory, not of the, the group that sometimes we talk about in, in New England as if it was their land that, that uh, the pilgrims landed on. No, no, no. Uh, what Samoset told them was the story of the Patuxets, a large hostile tribe who had bar barbarously murdered every outsider that had ever landed on their shores. But four years prior to the pilgrim's arrival, a mysterious plague had broken out among them, killing every man, woman, and child. So complete was the devastation that the neighboring tribes had shunned the area ever since convinced that some great supernatural spirit had destroyed the Patuxets. Hence, the cleared land on which they settled literally belonged to no one. Who could have guessed it? They didn't aim for it. 
but God had managed to allow them to land at this particular spot where it would be the safest. Their nearest neighbors, of course, were some 50, 60 miles to the southwest. And these are some of those that join in with the celebration today, some of the descendants of those tribes. But they were not the ones who owned this land that the pilgrims landed on. Now, some of those that were out on the Cape that had attacked them was another tribe, the Nossets, numbered about 100 warriors who uh, sometimes attacked others. They, again, weren't from this region. They were from somewhere else. They had just showed up, and, and um, as they sometimes had done, it harassed and attacked them. But they weren't concerned about protecting their own land. They were just foraging and, and going from place to place, uh, not intent on possessing that property that the pilgrims had landed on. So this started uh, an interesting set of miracles as they began to get all the stories from Samoset that they needed to understand the history of the place that they had landed. But along with that, he in introduced them to yet another Native American, one named Squanto. Squanto is one of those who, uh, again, spoke flawless English. He already had some background with uh, English settlers and explorers before, and his story is a long, involved story that you need to read sometime. It's, again, uh, just a picture of God's grace and how he prepared this one particular Native American to be the blessing upon these pilgrims and allow them to survive and raise crops and celebrate that first Thanksgiving. So some of these amazing people that God had put into their life, some of the amazing circumstances that seem to have been engineered from completely outside their control had allowed these early settlers to, even despite losing almost half their number in the first year, in the first months rather, for that, for that matter, uh, allowed them to establish this particular colony at what we call Plymouth today. So friends, it's amazing how God can have his hand on us even in the most difficult of circumstances. And you know, this is one of those Thanksgiving days in which many of you are facing difficult circumstances. If you, for example, live in the New England area today, if you're in the state of Vermont, you've been told that you can't even have Thanksgiving outside of your own household. And if you gather with more than one household and you have children that go to school on Monday, did you know that they, and as well as you as parents, will be interrogated? And if you have been bold enough to go visit grandma on Thanksgiving Day and involve yourself with a neighboring household of any kind, then you will be forced to go back home and do virtual classes for two solid weeks. You'll be literally quarantined from being able to go back to school unless you can come back in one week if you bring a negative COVID test with you. And what, what is it that has allowed us to devolve into societies where we will literally restrict people from their basic freedoms and sharing time with family, some of which they've been hanging out with and already know that they're safe, not, you know, not, not giving us any credit for uh, being able to live our life safely in the midst of this pandemic and to know what's right and wrong as far as what to do. So friends, listen, as we deal with those kind of things, recognize, recognize that it is our attitude that makes all the difference. And wh wherever you are today, as you try to celebrate and have a happy Thanksgiving, I hope and pray you'll follow the scripture. Be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in the Word and look at the story of that first Thanksgiving celebration. God bless you.